<laughs> oh, hey everybody. Welcome everybody. Sorry. Welcome from Switzerland. I'm calling um, you from Lucerne, Switzerland. We didn't know we were live. Technical difficulties like usual. So uh, we're having a good time here in Europe. Yeah. A yeah. lot of fun. We're learning a lot. Yeah, it's our first time in Switzerland. It's beautiful here. Oh my gosh, we did the most amazing spa today, and the city is amazing, and we're just loving it. That's right. It's uh, about eight, eight, eight at night uh, here, um, and um, so we wanted to talk about the video, that video I did uh, about the 1970s. We do, but we don't want to hop into it quite yet. Okay, here we, we have are. a few here, things. Here we go again. <laughs> I'm always the one that keeps him on his schedule, so... Anyways, before we hop into that, let's pull up the Twitter question of the week. So, Ken, you asked, what impact will the emerging technologies like blockchain and AI have on real estate? And Dr. Jody says, loan against crypto for mortgages and much more streamlined title companies and reduce realtor expenses with blockchain contracts. Yeah. We're already seeing that. You know, there's a big uh, lawsuit going on um, with our realtors right now, um, all the way to the Supreme Court. I forget which state. But they're challenging their commissions because they're saying this this man listed his home uh, is a without a company and the realtors wouldn't show it because he wasn't offering any commission and he and technically as a realtor you're not allowed to do that and uh, so he's suing and it's all the way to Supreme Court so it's gonna be interesting for yeah. realtor commissions that that is going to be true well they say if you just follow history um, take a look at um, many of you might not realize that there was a day where we had travel agents. Um, and now everything's on the internet, and it's all um, super easy to obviously book your own flights and book your own hotels. It wasn't, didn't used to be like that. Um, and then uh, they say that that's going to happen with wealth managers, financial planners, you know, that you can buy insurance and some of these financial products uh, that way. Same thing with real estate. So, um, you know, just I'm not saying that it's going to happen quickly, but it's definitely trending that way you're starting to see already reduced realtor commissions people are um, offering you know the one percent commission things like that so you're starting to see that already uh, also there's a huge jump in realtors as you guys know um, mm -hmm. in, in this last run so that also has something to do with it yep absolutely jerry if you want to put up the next one um Bitcoin, not blockchain. Bitcoin will slightly, or maybe should I say slowly but surely, demonetize real estate. Uh, real estate will still be a great investment, but with time, more and more people will choose to put their savings into Bitcoin. That's a possibility. Maybe, you know. Yeah, the Fed's going to fight that. Uh, yeah. Well, obviously, the any kind of digital currency. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be a long, drawn-out fight, as you all know. And um, But I do think uh, over the long haul, it's probably going to be true. Yeah, I don't know if it'll replace real estate, but it'll definitely, uh, you know, it's very similar to the stock market. You know, we were talking about that. You know, Bitcoin seems to move with the stock market, um, at least right now. And it's not fully, an, it's an asset, I guess, but it's not a tangible asset, really. So. Well, it has, it, it, you can't use it in a lot of spots. A lot of people found that uh, as their, their value went up, they had a tough time pulling it out. Um, and then um, trading it. I had people trying to buy real estate for it. Um, with and, it. Yeah, uh, with, with, with Bitcoin, obviously. We had some offers, actually, some full price offers of people that were trying to trade me Bitcoin for, for the asset. So that's part of the issue. And then who, you know, who actually um, takes it Yeah, well, as a medium of exchange. Correct. And number three is realtors and property managers will get, get more efficient. If you are needed... To, you are needed to do more volume. Title abstract will all be on the blockchain, basically eliminating title insurance. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, I think blockchain is going to be really good for title insurance um, because we're going to have someone on the show um, pretty soon that you know specializes in titles and how title insurance sometimes doesn't check fully check the titles uh, as you would think that it would. And so blockchain is really going to help that because it really shows the start to the end it's of a, everything. It's a ledger system. Yep. Yeah. It's. Yeah. I I agree with you. So that was very interesting. For the 17 of you that have already slammed that like button, thank you so much. Everyone else watching, please hit it. It really helps us out. As you all know, we are coming to you from Switzerland, so don't mind the uh, poor video quality compared to when we're in the studio. 
But we wanted to dive into Ken's video that he did released on Friday. He was comparing now to the 1970s. And I think it's important to note that no two decades are going to be exactly alike because we got some comments saying, you know, it's not exactly like the 70s. But we want to talk about, you know, how it is like the 70s. And we want you guys to challenge that too because I think it's interesting. I'm going to read a couple comments later on of people that did challenge that. Um, but let's kind of dive into to 2023. Well, I, I did, first of all, I did know... I did know that people were going to say, you, you know, point out the, the things that aren't the same. Uh, obviously, before I did the video, that's obvious. Hopefully, it's obvious that, you know, just like anything you've done last year or the year before, <laughs> it's not going to be the same. So, uh, but the point is, is when the Fed increases rates, when there's um, oil embargoes and there's high inflation, and there are things like um, you know printing of money. You know, what are the similarities? And that's what I was trying to point out. And um, well, it's certainly not the '70s. There's a lot of things in the '70s that um, um, were unusual. Like uh, Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard, probably is one of the bigger ones. But also the the oil embargo, which if you think about what that was, it, you know, obviously I was, I was very young, but the, the point is, is the oil is used as a weapon back in the 70s. And that's what the Saudis did because we supported Israel. And so any nation that supported Israel in that Yom Kippur war, that's what happened. So they put um, the, the, the price of oil that per barrel went up uh, by three times. So that created uh, prices at the pump, that created inflation. Um, obviously, lots of things happened as a result of that, but the oil was used as a weapon. That is the point. And that was the point of the video, was with the Russian-Ukraine war, with this uh, Israel and Hamas war, and the government's involvement, and oil, especially in Iran, and the Saudis, you know, what is going to happen with oil? That actually is kind of the point, right? Did yeah. I, did I go too You're far? You're just jumping ahead. That's okay. Right. So, um, so let's talk about, you know, a couple of things. So obviously in the 70s, the dollar was decoupled from gold. And that's obviously what caused mass inflation, which is very different than right now. Yeah, and if you could leave that up for a minute, um, this is interesting. Take a look at this. The 90-day wage price freeze, uh, tax cuts, new jobs in a broad plan, um, and severing the link between the dollar and gold. Now, what's interesting is that here we are in Switzerland right now, um, and their Swiss franc was tied to gold as well. And um, in fact, it still is partially tied to gold, and they're sitting at less than two percent inflation. So here's a here's a five dollar Swiss franc, here's a five dollar euro, and here's a five dollar bill. Um, and right now, if you if you're paying attention to what everybody wants, is they want these Swiss francs. And part of the pro, part of the reason that the Swiss pulled off of the the, the gold system was because when the U.S. decoupled from gold people started buying Swiss francs because it was tied to gold. So ironically, um, and the only reason I bring that up is because it's all very connected. Um, people will invest where their money's treated best. And what happened when we took the dollar off the gold standard is we became a fiat currency. And that meant that we could print more of these. And when we print more of these, it devalues them. Um, so when you guys think that your house is going up so much, what's actually happening is that the, the, the value of this is actually going down. Right. That, that's so, the point. Yeah. So essentially, when in the 70s, what happened is, you know, once we got off of gold, inflation skyrocketed. And the feds did what they're doing now, which is they raised interest rates to try to combat the inflation. Uh, 11 times. Did they 11 times? Well, that oh, was? back then, yeah. Um, so look at this. So take a look at this chart. This is one that Jerry put up. Uh, 
got to thank Jerry who who did this. Uh, make, he makes my videos look great. But take a look at 1972 at the low point there. So that what's important what's important to understand is that Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard in 71. Then what happened? The CPI actually went down. Then all of a sudden it shot up. And um, obviously it went all the way up. And this, that's inflation, folks. And then that's when, the, that's when the interest rates started to go up. And also during this time was the, 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 the price of oil. Although the, the tripling of the price of oil wasn't the only thing that was uh, creating inflation. Uh, but the, the point here, again, is we have not really had to worry about oil. Oh, well, let's okay. not get All too right. far let's, ahead yet, okay? I do this every time. So home prices also <laughs> doubled in the 70s. They the did. The exact same thing happened. Actually, more than doubled. Yep. Look at that. Take a look at that, guys. If you can imagine, in 71, the home the price of a home was under 30 grand. Can you imagine that? And look at what they were at the end. They were, I think, in, uh, up, uh, let me see, what, where is that? Uh, by the 80s, they were up over 70. So more than doubled. And what that was, this is all during a period of high interest rates. And that's the point. So these houses went up. So everybody who's talking about a, a, a home a price crash, we did a video, Daniel and I did a video, was that we don't believe that's going to happen. High interest rates don't necessarily mean that we're gonna have a crash. The difference in 2008 is that the builders and, and people were sitting on excess inventory. There was a tremendous amount of excess inventory. Um, and so the average amount of listings is around six months. If you go year over year averages, let's say on the MLS, between five and six months. Right now, today, there's 3.4 months. So um, during the crash in 08, it was, it was way past six months. And so there was a supply problem. That's not what we have today. And so just like in the 70s, it's possible that if we have inflation, and some people think we might even get hyperinflation, that that is actually what's going to make whatever, whatever asset you own today, it's going to make it worth even more. That's what inflation does. It's actually devaluing the dollar um, and, it, and you think it's um, your price of your house is going up as a result of appreciation, and it is, but it's actually the dollar that's devaluing, and that's what's actually doing it. Right, exactly. So then coupled, now that you want to talk about oil, okay. so we also have All right. this. All right. um, but in the 70s, we also had an energy crisis on oil, and today it's because of Russia and now probably Israel. We're expecting, you know, oil prices to definitely go up if this expands, which it looks like it might. Um, in the 70s, we also had an issue with the Yom Kippur War, uh, which was with Israel, right? And so that was, um, and it was also the Iranian Revolution. So both of those things caused oil prices to go up and oil prices in fact affect inflation. Well, right. And so I think it's important to understand why oil prices went up. It's because of the, the Saudi government issued sanctions. Um, and they said anybody that's supporting uh, Israel, um, we're going to sanction oil. Okay. So what you might not know is that the Biden just issued a policy where they're doing the exact same thing against Russia. Uh, what they're saying is, is that Russia, well, Russia's big part of Russia's revenues are, is selling oil. And they capped it, I think it was at $60. Uh, you just Google this and you'll see it. Janet Yellen's talked about it. There's a bunch of politicians that are talking about it because they bypassed it. And what, what, they're, what they're doing is, is they're, they're saying they're trying to cut off Russia's ability to finance the war with their oil that they use for revenue. That's the point, that's exactly what happened, um, well, partially exactly what happened in, uh, in the 70s. And so that's why oil went up. That's why prices at the pump went up. 
is because we were reliant um, on that oil at the time. Now, we're not as reliant. Things are very different today, but now we have two wars and you have to pay attention, I believe, to what's going on with oil because everybody's focused on shelter and food. Um, the, if you look at the, the Fed, I think they're actually, obviously they're crushing real estate right now with these high interest rates. Um, that's another topic. Um, but um, they're also trying to manage the food prices and insurance and all those kinds of things. The wild card, I believe, is oil based on what's going on with the tensions. Um, now, with, with China, with Russia, with um, the U Ukraine, with Israel, with Hamas, all of that stuff, it has implications on the oil front. That's all I'm trying to say. Yeah, and it does. And as you were explaining, you know, oil goes into food, it goes into manufacturing, it goes into agriculture, it goes into everything. So oil prices are a big deal because they make everything go up. And a few people have commented, well, will this push, you know, the green agenda? And the green agenda, we still need oil. You know what I mean? It, yeah. We can't do it all um, through solar and everything else yet. It, we're just not there. And so at least right now, I mean, they can change the price of oil tomorrow and that affects it right away and it will be quick. So it's not going to help us right now to expand the green agenda. Um, but I do think they'll use it as a political tool for sure. Oh, for sure. But anything that comes into the U.S., um, let's say, because we are well, obviously one of the biggest importers of things, um, is transported by oil. Um, and many things are, are uh, you know, to be manufactured um, are used with oil. So, so all of that. So just imagine, you know, in, in the 70s, uh, by the way, I don't think we're going to get there. I sure hope not. Um, you know, there were lines of people just waiting for gas. So um, all that did is push, again, it's a supply issue. Lack of supply, high demand creates higher prices. That's all. And if that happens then that's going to make its way into the CPI. It's going to actually create a problem with inflation. Um, and one of the things I pointed out in the video was I think in the early 70s, the federal funds rate was right around five. Now, right now, the federal funds rate is right around five. Okay, and so for most of you, after 11 increases, you think that federal funds rate is super high. Um, well, if you look at history, it's actually not. Um, and so um, it went up a lot in the 70s from that period of time, and primarily as a result of this oil embargo. Because again, as inflation continued to go up, the, Fed, the Federal Reserve had to continue to increase the, the, uh, the federal funds rates to, to calm down the economy. That's actually what one of the tools that they have to temper inflation. That was the point of the video. Um, now, who knows what will happen? Of course, I'm, I'm just somebody like you, just trying to study and figure this out. Um, but there is a lot of, there are a lot of similarities between the 70s and today. Yeah, and something else is interesting. So if you look at the 80s, because a lot of you are pointing out, well, the 80s, you know, there was a housing correction. Um, from it going up so much in the 70s. But there's a stark difference there. Um, so in the 70s, construction percentages remain the same. So there was less construction, but there was still 33% of construction was going to starter homes. Now, uh, right now where we're at is only 11% of our builds are going to starter homes. And obviously building is down because it's expensive. And out of those 11%, uh, only 8% are 1,400 square feet or below. So the point is, is we don't ha we're not going to have a lot of starter home supply. You have all these millennials that are in the prime of their home buying years. And if they want a home, they're going to have that competition for a home. And you also have a bunch of people sitting at super low interest rates that don't want to sell. So that is the difference between the 80s, where people are pointing out where home prices dropped, and now. Yeah, the other thing is in the early 80s, as you guys probably do know, is that uh, in the interest rates were 15%. Uh, so, you know, right now we're at eight. So uh, are they going to be double? And what will happen to real estate prices if they do double? 
you know, that seems absurd, obviously, to even say. But that's where they were in the 80s, if you're going to compare this with the 80s. And let's don't forget, the reason why they were that high is because they were trying to tamper down that inflation that was created as a result of all those things we already mentioned. So, um, you, you know, who knows, you know, where this will all go. The, but I will leave you with two words here. Renter nation. Okay, because right now the average price of a home, although home prices have gone down a little bit, we still um, are just have over 3.4 months of, of inventory, uh, which is way below the six month average. So we still have a supply problem. And, um, well, I should say there is a supply problem. And so even though home prices are down a little bit, interest rates are up at eight. So there's people can't afford to buy a home because just because prices came down a little bit. And I know all of you want home prices to go up. But if home prices are up and interest rates are up, people are going to have to rent. And so um, a lot of folks that would normally buy something are going to be forced into rental housing. And... Um, and the you know if you're if you're like me i follow the construction business because we have a construction company i have six projects i have two under construction and four in pre-development and the price to build those have gone up a lot and our our construction debt is anywhere about nine percent eight to ten percent to build that's that's significantly higher than it was just two years ago what does that mean? That means that people like me are putting land on the shelf and waiting to see what happens. I don't know if prices are gonna, or the in price of interest is gonna go down. I don't know if the cost of lumber and, and concrete and, and appliances and all that stuff is going to go down. But one thing I do know is if I try to build those today, I can't build them affordably and I can't build them for what I thought they were going to be. So I'm not going to do that. And so we have this gap uh, starting at about a year ago where home builders and multifamily builders decided to pause and put some of these projects on hold. And, um, and so what, what's that going to do? At the same time, people that were supposed to be buying homes because the natural progression is for people to move into a rental and then move in and buy a home. And as, as rates are cheap, they buy. And when rates are exp, uh, expensive, they don't buy, they rent. So we have all these people that are going to be forced into the rental housing and we have a rental housing shortage. Just, just look, just Google it. It's just simple math. Um, you, if you're paying attention to articles that the Wall Street Journal or, some, or, or another um, uh, media outlet came out with in the last six months you're going to say oh we're oversupplied we got a problem rents are going down that might be true temporarily um, and in some markets that is true but from somebody that has over 10,000 units and, and and follows all these markets I can tell you the only thing that's happened is instead of six or eight or ten percent rent growth I'm at one to three percent which is what my whole career was based on so this is very normal. The market is normalizing. That's what's happening. But what the problem we still have is we have a massive supply problem that's going to hit in 25, 26, and 27. Um, and um, it's, it's not going to get any better unless these, these, uh, these prices come down and these interest rates come down. But when interest rates come down, what happens? Prices go back up. So the Fed has another problem. Absolutely. And it's just really an interesting, you know, what, what's happening with everything currently and how it's going to kind of pan out. A lot of people think we're going to have a big price drop. We're kind of in the minority that, that doesn't think we are um, on single family homes. Commercial is different, but single family. Now, I wanted to read a couple comments here. For those listening, make sure to hit the like button. We love that. It helps us out. Um, they challenged your video a little bit. Good. So I want to kind of give them some, some props here and, you know, we got, we got say. some smart people out there, we do. so I, I can't wait to hear. So Steve said, we just grew along with the inflation in the 70s. They aren't growing the same now. Whatever that causes, it will prevent real estate prices from exploding the way they did back then. Rents and values aren't tied together precisely, but they aren't completely disconnected. 
Right. Yeah. The, he's got a point. I, I think the the you, if if we are comparing the seventies, the interesting thing to me is that during the seventies and of course in the early eighties, the interest rate continued to go up. If you look at the federal funds rate, the Federal Reserve, just like they did, although nobody's ever seen them do it eleven times this quickly, um, they raised the interest rates over time to try to temper things, and it didn't work. <laughs> Home prices went from thirty grand to seventy-five grand in a ten-year period, and everybody felt rich. But really, in theory, what happened was the dollar was devalued by inflation. So if you if you're holding on to savings and you had a hundred bucks in in um, in, in uh, the '72, um, that bought you a lot less in '82, and that's the point. And um, you know it showed up in housing in in the housing prices, and, and then only in a, in the early in the early 1980s, when the interest rates were up in the 15 percent range, um, did it actually break. And um, and we and we started to see some relief. So um, I think he's right. It's not uh, directly tied, but it is indirectly because when the price of money is cheap, people buy things. They buy appliances. They buy cars. They buy real estate. Now, right now, at eight percent, that's not cheap. And let's don't forget last last week, the ten-year Treasury uh, busted over the five percent mark for the first time since 2007. Now that should interest you because what that does is that specifically is tied to so many things. It's tied to real estate, it's tied to auto loans. I mean, what is it, how much is it uh, to get a new auto today? I think it's like 10%, something like that, to buy a new auto. Okay, that's the result of this higher treasury. And the other interesting thing that just um, you need to pay attention to is you know, for years, the stock market and financial planners and everybody would say to you, hey, we can make you six, seven, eight percent compounded, of course, you know, um, if you give us all your money, essentially. Now you can put it in a in a one month T bill, almost risk free from the government and um, and get over five percent. So, you know, you can get almost that in a savings account. And so that's what's going on with with um, um, the, the the markets is that you know people are uh, saying I'm gonna I'm gonna be in a safe haven right here. It's a lot easier for me just to be in cash, and it was it hasn't been like that way for a long long time. Right, and that actually goes into our first question. So there's some people saying you need to speak a little louder. Oh, so go sorry. ahead and do that. Um, so this we're going to inner circle questions. You can become a member by going to uh, kenmacroy.com forward slash join dash now. And it's $30 a month and you get access to Ken. You can ask him questions. We have happy hours, lunch and learns, etc. So Hector said he's been successful in his investment properties and he thanks you because he refinanced them all at fixed debt. But now he doesn't know what to do with his money because he can't find any cash flowing <laughs> deals. So what should he do? Yeah, yeah. Um, if I were you, I would just put it in that one month T bill at, five, at north of five percent, um, and wait. You know, we're we're we have a, a ways to uncouple. So if you take a look at what's going on, the first the first wave of real estate crash is going to be in the commercial, probably commercial office. So commercial office, um, and then anything that was financed with, you know, call it short-term debt, is that that is going to be renewing through the end of this year and into next year. I think it was last I looked, it was 1.5 trillion. That's with a T um, in in commercial debt maturity at the end of next year. So depending on what the Fed does, um, that's going to really, really. Um, mess up a lot of banks and so I think you're better off just to be in cash right now and let you know let um, as I like to say you don't try to catch a falling knife you know um, just just let things uncouple and and let the markets do their thing uh, now's the time to watch and and uh, 
and if something cash flows and you can step into somebody's debt long term, then that's a good opportunity. So like in the commercial world, there are people and there are deals that we're looking at where we can actually acquire a property with an, with an assumption. Um, the loan would maybe be, say, 3.5%. We would actually step into the shoes of that loan and that asset. And then, of course, that, uh, that lower loan is, uh, is significantly better than we'll, what we would get today. So the other way, obviously, is to buy all cash in a distressed situation. So like right now I'm buying a, um, a billboard company. Uh, I, can't, uh, I can't disclose too much about it, but I'm gonna close it by the end of the year, all cash. And you might ask why I would do that. Well, first of all, it's uh, established billboards. It's a 26 year old company. Um, and I'm stepping into cash flow, but more importantly, I'm getting 80% bonus depreciation on all the billboards. And so I'm going to get um, uh, the bonus depreciation, the way the bonus depreciation works is I'll get it, I, can, I can write off 80% of the price of the company um, after you know some CPA math. So it's not gonna be um, 80% of the total, but it'll be, it'll be pretty darn close. And why would I do that? I would do that to be able to offset capital gains. And so I'm getting cash flow and I'm getting capital gains. So there are lots of deals out there. There are businesses that are struggling with assets. There are, there are owners that own real estate that are struggling with assets. And so, you know, you might want to take a look at, I'm not putting any debt on this. You might want to take a look at buying things all cash that cash flow. Absolutely. And I want to get to Ryan's question. Ryan from YouTube. He said, Ken and Daniel, can you guys talk about Fannie Mae allowing 5% down payments um, on multifamily units? So just to clarify for everyone, before you would need usually 20% down um, to purchase multifamily units conventionally through Fannie and Freddie. They've now just changed that to 5%. Yeah, the uh, thank you for bringing that one up. Uh, you know, how do people make money? Well, I want you to think about that. So a lender makes money when they lend. That's the most important thing to understand. So, you know, while you might be the one trying to borrow that money, think of the person that's trying to lend that money. Think of the lender, think of the mortgage broker. So... This is um, a way to stimulate borrowing, and there's nothing wrong with it. It's happened before, but what I mostly what I want you to understand is what's the price of the 95% loan? That's the biggest issue. It's not that it's 5% down. That's a great way to get into the game, but what is the price of the 95% and is it covered by a renter? If, if the 95% loan is covered by a renter, then it's probably not a bad deal to do. But as you guys know, when I use debt, any kind of debt, no matter what the leverage is, I always want it to be covered by somebody else. So I never buy and try to time a market for it to go up. And um, so uh, it has to cash flow, and there's nothing wrong with programs like this, but they have to work, the math has to work. Do you think that it's gonna put people in more of a jam, like newer people thinking they just need to put 5% down? It's very possible. Um, that's what I get afraid of is, it, you know, this is, I, I think that um, you don't wanna be in a situation where you're in a negative cash flow. You don't want to be in a situation where you think that the market's going to go up and you're going to exit at some point and that's how you're going to pay everything off. So that's just, that's called hope and that's not a strategy. You, you know, it has to work with a renter in there. It has to work somehow to where that loan is covered by somebody else that's secured long term. And um, you, it cannot work 
uh, based on the, the price going up. And that's kind of the lesson. So there's nothing wrong with these low down, high interest, or I'm sorry, high leverage deals, as long as they cash flow. Yeah, it's just one of those things where you just don't want somebody to get suckered in thinking, oh, I only need 5% down, so now I can afford this. And then they're trying to squeak by. And, and do you think partially that Fannie's doing that because their loan program is so stalled right now, they need loans to make money themselves? Well, like anything, if you, hopefully you guys are following, you take a look at the real estate industry. You, you know, who's been most affected? Um, realtors, flippers, hard money lenders, regular mortgages, title companies, insurance companies. These are all companies that um, participate in the fees when deals are done. And so, you know, if a lot of these companies have, are laying off and a lot of these companies are downsizing and nobody makes money if nobody makes a move. That's kind of the point. So there has to be a transaction. And when there's a transaction, there's a lot of people involved in that transaction from title insurance to realtors to, to lenders to uh, contractors. And real, you know, you get you get the point. So you know, when we are going to start to see, that's why you start to see these teaser rates with home builders. You know, the home builders are buying down the rates for what, a year? Then what happens? You know, all they're really doing is baking that into the loan. You're paying for it anyway. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so you think that you're getting, a, um, you know, a, a, into a home for cheap, and you are for at least a year. But then you have to brace yourself for that next year, so or, or whenever it kicks in. So, so that's that's what you always just have to look at. Um, the five percent program might work and it might work really well, but um, you have to make sure that it's covered by somebody else and not you, or at least if if it is covered by you, that you have the financial resources to keep that long term. Absolutely. And T Golfer said, I'm considering the lower multifamily down payment as well, but renters would only ever cover the mortgage partially due to high um, PITI, which yeah, is principal your, and interest yeah. tax and insurance. Yep. Yeah. So interesting. It's a great question. Yep. So Brandon from our inner circle program, he's having a NIMBY issue. Ah, so not, let me, not in my backyard. So let, That's me, what NIMBY uh, is. let me just, this is a very long question, but let me just paraphrase it. So the state of Maine is allowing two ADUs per uh, lot of land, you know, with a home on it. And they're trying to do this because of the affordable housing issue. Where he lives in a little more staunchy of an area, and they're saying, not in my backyard. We don't want all these renters. So now they've said you have to owner occupy the main house. And then you can have the two ADUs. Mm. So what Brandon's question is, is, is there any way I can fight this? Because it was a state order that you have to be allowed to do this. And now his municipality has uh, made these rules. That's above my pay grade. I'm, I'm <laughs> sorry. I, you know, I, I, I think you got a, um, probably a big fight on your hands. Um, you know, you might have something if you already bought and you are already in the process, and you might be grandfathered in, but um, to do something new uh, would be uh, hard. But you can definitely—I um, mean, you can definitely fight something like this. It, it just be prepared for a long battle. Nobody wants renters. Um, that's the thing: is everybody wants affordability, but they don't want to allow density. So yeah. <laughs> you, you know, so you, you, this is the same issue we've been fighting for years: is nobody wants multifamily almost every single property that we have um, we have big neighborhood hearings and and you know city council hearings and it's funny because the 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 city council on one hand they get they get development fees and they get fees um, to, to do all these things at the same time they're listening to all the homeowners saying they don't want the renters because they're Going to crowd the schools, and they're going to create parking problems, and all of those things. But what they don't realize is that um, 
the renters in those areas won't be able to live in those areas because the price to rent is going to be too high. And so they're going to be what will suffer would be, you know, the service. And this has been an age old problem that, you know, we talk about like just teachers and firefighters and, and let's say police, for example, ambulance. Um, imagine if they could not afford to live in the community next to you. Imagine if they were 15 or 20 minutes away because that's where they had to live. And the response times are, are real things, and they're looked at. So there, was, there are response times are big issues because if somebody gets in an accident or has a heart attack or has some kind of problem, you, know, you want somebody there quickly. But if they can't afford to live in your community, they're not going to be able to. I think it is funny, though, because everyone does want affordable. Oh, we want affordable housing. We're all for affordable housing. And then they just don't want it by them. <laughs> yeah. We want to just, it, not around us, yeah. but we do want affordable housing. But, you know, Brandon, you could try to get creative on this, um, you know, if you want to. I don't know if you have any kids or anything. You can make them a partial owner, put them in a primary house, house hack it, add the ADUs. You know, but is try, trying to change the code is going to be pretty hard, pretty hard battle. Um, we see that a lot, you know, where we're at um, in Arizona. Our, our area doesn't really like rentals, and they nix every apartment complex that tries to build there. Uh, HOAs are another thing that don't like ADUs. So there's a lot of um, barriers to entry, and you'd be better off trying to find a home in an area that is allowing it because it can still be a good deal or to do it at your own primary home, but maybe you don't want renters in your yard either. So, I don't, you know, so, um, but it's really hard to change those policies. I would, I, would, I would go buy a house next to the mayor and put two in behind. <laughs> yeah, That's and I just would. live in it. Yeah. Um, Eli wants to know uh, from YouTube, do you think that banks could call their debts due and force borrowers to refi at higher rates? This is a great question. So It's a big question. Yeah, yeah. So it's highly possible. I will tell you that banks are horrible owners of real estate. Mm -hmm. From my personal experience, I bought a lot of stuff from banks. Um, not all banks are created equal. Um, I think that um, they're, they're probably going to be faced with a couple problems. The first one is... Right now, rates are at eight, let's say. Let's say rates are at eight today. You might have something at uh, four, let's say. So the bank can, there's no way a bank is going to kick the can down the road and renew a loan at four when they're paying savings rates at four and a half and 5%. So you can park money in that same bank which is, remember, savings, is, that's a liability to the bank. So if you've got 100 grand in savings and you're paying out four and a half, um, that's a liability to the bank and it's an expense to the bank. And if they have a loan that was at four, um, you know, it's, it's going to be, a, it's, it, they're upside down. So I think that, uh, you know, their, their expenses and what they're taking in, um, their expenses are higher than what they're taking in. So I think that um, that's one problem. The other one is you got to look at the value of what they think it's going to be and the loan to value. So that like if it's a commercial loan, more than likely the values are down. If it's a residential loan, perhaps not. But uh, for sure in the commercial side, the values are definitely down and their loan to values are down. So in my world, the, and what I think is going to continue to happen is we're going to have some uh, low loan to value. Got to you know, talk louder. Okay, like 50% 50, 50 to 60% loan to value, which means that you're going to have to come up with more equity. So you have to take a look at the equity you have, the rate that you used to have, and what the, what the amount that the bank is, is, is putting out today um, and most people are going to be facing cash calls. And that's actually, I think, what's going to level the playing field in the next 14 months and through next year is, you know, is these loan maturities. Most banks are not going to be able to uh, carry 
carry these further. Yeah, and I, I think to maybe Ken didn't understand part of the question is on the 30-year fixed rate loans, the bank can't really call them due. They have to have a reason because you have a contract oh. with them. But what we are seeing is if you're in violation of the contract, certain things that they may have looked over before, they may decide to not look over any longer. So, you know, whether that's subject to or whether that's, you know, your... Um, your loans in an LLC or things that they typically would say they don't want to bother with. Well, now if you're at three percent and you need to be closer to eight percent, they might start calling things due and paying more attention to those things. That could be true. I'm sorry. I, I thought you were talking about loan maturities, um, but yes, a bank. Uh, we have we have assets that, uh, for example, have what's called debt service coverage, uh, which which basically says you have to have a certain percentage of income to be able to cover the debt. So as debt went up, um, and let's say in, the income stayed the same, now we have debt service coverage issues. Those are loan covenants that the lender can definitely pull out and have conversations with you. They can require additional reserves. They can require other things based on what's inside of your, your loan agreement. So it's going to be based on the loan covenants inside of the loan agreement, just like any contract. So you just got to, it's all going to boil down to that. Absolutely. Um, Contalacian is saying, one of my properties was purchased using a debt service coverage loan. Mm -hmm. I made improvements and expect to have forced equity. Should I cash out or refi or do a HELOC? So... Um, it, I, I'm not sure of what all the math is here, but um, my guess is a cash out or a refi or a HELOC is pro or cash out refi or HELOC probably is not something that you're going to be able to do right now uh, based on the higher rate. You, you know, we're seeing lower loan values and we're seeing higher interest rates. So, um, but obviously if you can fix a rate still have cash flow and take money off the table, then then that's a good strategy. But if it's going to be variable and you're, you're just trying to get money out um, and you're going to be paying it back based on the higher interest rates, it's probably not worth it right now. You know, we're, we're looking at 2024 as a company of not being able to do any cash out refis in 2024 as a result of where rates are. Because, um, no, don't forget, I can cash out refi at any time. I might have to pay a prepayment penalty, but why would I take something that's 3 or 4 or 5% and trade it out for 8 only to get some cash and to have a higher payment and have my debt service coverages out of whack? So, you know, so as a company, we're just going to probably hold tight on all of our, all of our loans because we consider a lot of those loans an asset now. Um, if you're in a if you're in a loan, a low interest loan, that's actually an asset. And I don't know about you guys, but when I went to college, you know, debt was considered a liability. Well, now if you've got debt at three or four percent, let's say, or even five, and it's trading out at eight, this is precisely why we have a an inventory problem. 84% of America are in interest rates under five. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to trade out because to get the exact same house next door for the same price, let's say, uh, they're going to pay uh, 3% or more in the mortgage. So they're going to, that's why the people are staying put. Absolutely. So Robert has an interesting question. So he's a home builder in Oregon. And um, Ooh, sorry about Oregon. He's he's <laughs> struggling because people aren't building right now because of the high interest rates, which totally is understandable. So he's considering um, building a tiny home community and selling the tiny homes. They've already built a couple. They can build them for twenty five thousand dollars, and it'll give his guys something to do and maybe him make some money. What are your thoughts on this? I one thousand percent agree with that strategy. Um, I know Portland very well. I know it has an urban growth boundary around it. 
which uh, they implemented in the 70s. And, um, you know, so if you guys don't know what that means, is that Portland didn't want urban sprawl. So a lot of cities have urban sprawl, like Phoenix, for example, where I live now, has urban sprawl. And Portland put this growth boundary around it. So everything inside the boundary has gone up in price, oddly enough, as you would imagine, uh, because they're, they're, they, they redevelop. And the, there's this uh, the, um, commission called the Portland Development Commission that actually governs a lot of the stuff that goes on inside of the boundary. And um, so anything that you can do, if you can build housing for 25 grand and you can make money on it and it keeps your company going, I would say absolutely go do that because it solves a bunch of things. One, it solves an affordability issue for the customer. And that, to me, is probably one of the bigger issues. Uh, two, it keeps your guys going, keeps you relevant. And you might even find that that could be a great strategy that you, that some of the, um, that might even put you on the map. And that, that might be, um, you know, the defining marker in the road for your business um, if you can continue to replicate that. Yeah, and I just think, you know, he's saying he wants to put them in like an RV park. And you have to make sure you can find one because those are very <laughs> hard. I mean, Oregon might be easier because they're really trying to focus on affordable housing. And you want it to be in an area that you would want to live in, you know, where you can rent to people. And secondly is you might want to consider, if you do all that, renting them versus selling them. Because at twenty five grand, you might be able to make your money back in a couple of years and uh, then it's all cash flow. Well, yeah, just take a look at the build to rent or BTR model. Um, you know, if you can find these RV parks or mobile home parks, you know, they're tough, I, they're tough to find. But yes, and it sounds to me like you do um, know some. I would I would absolutely do that. Now, affordable housing is going to be the big thing in the next 10 years. So, um, you know, uh, if you can build something for 25 grand, I would absolutely do that. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're they, even seeing like micro units and things being built in Seattle, which are super small, 500 square foot apartments. I mean, that's it's going to be a, a big issue. Home Home Depot has a kit that you can pay 50 grand for uh, for 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 small houses. So, you know, if you can do what Home Depot is selling for 50 grand for half, um, I think you do it all day long. Yep, absolutely. Well, thank you guys. We'll see you next week. Oh, Make sure we're already you done? slam that like button and we're off to bed. Greetings, <laughs> greetings from uh, uh, Switzerland. Switzerland, guys. Switzerland. It's great, great chatting with you. Thanks again, as always. We'll see you next week. We'll be in Paris. Ooh.